Welcome everyone to History Hour presented by Behringer Crawford Museum. We'll be starting here another minute or two as we let some more people log into uh, Zoom. Thank you all for coming tonight. If you're on Facebook Live, just give us a few more moments and we'll get started here. All right, thank you for joining us tonight. It is uh, 6.31 by my computer. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Northern Kentucky History Hour. I'm your host for tonight, Joe Weber. Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of Barringer Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum. Barringer Crawford Museum is supported in part by the City of Covington, Kenton County, Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph V. Hale Jr. U.S. Bank Foundation, and our members. If you're not yet a member of the museum, please consider joining for access to discounts and exclusive programming. Learn more and join at bcmmuseum.org. Before we begin, let's go over a few reminders. Everyone's microphone has been muted so we can all focus on the presentation. Feel free to turn off your video if you prefer. Otherwise, others on the call are able to see you even when the screen is being shared. If you have any questions or comments to share, please type them in the chat feature and we will try to get to as many questions as possible immediately following the presentation. Also, there will be a quiz question tonight. Uh, the quiz question will be after the presentation, so we'll talk about that when it's uh, over. Uh, the winner of the quiz question will receive a pin, which I would show you right here, but I don't have any, so just pretend that that's a nice little pin, plus bragging rights. Um, so. The first person that answers that question on chat um, on the Zoom or on Facebook Live will uh, win that uh, pin for tonight. So let's meet tonight's speaker, Cam Miller. Cam has for nearly 20 years directed, edited, and designed soundscapes and composed performed projects in the region. He is best known for his work with the Cincinnati Reds in their Hall of Fame, producing exhibits including the 1919 Cincinnati Reds, Crosley Field Remembered, and Our True Blues, The Story of the Covington Blue Sox. Old Latonia, America's Most Beautiful Race Course, won the Blue Chip Medal Award for the Best document, Documentary. He was an American, he has an Americana folk country album entitled Old Latonia due out this summer. Cam, welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thanks everyone for uh, spending some time with us on this un unbelievably hot summer. Day. I was just joking with somebody earlier that I liked last week better that it was, uh, I called it October because it was so much more pleasant, but this is what Cincinnati summers are, so we must deal with it. Um, again, thank you very much for coming. Some of you may have seen my film, um, Our Shining Stars, um, the story of the, Cove or the Covington Stars Baseball Club. Um, it was kind of a prequel to the uh, Our True Blues, the uh, documentary about the Covington Blue Sox, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with if you're history buffs, uh, considering that uh, Smoke Justice, the uh, bar in Covington, the sports bar, um, opened because of their love affair and passion for the Covington Blue Sox team, and of course, Walter Smoke Justice being the starting pitcher. So really was an honor to be involved with that um, sports bar opening up. So Again, this is a prequel to that. So I'm going to go back in time a little bit, even before 1913 and the, uh, the Covington Blue Sox. So I will spend the first half talking about the team, kind of give you the idea of how the team came about, what baseball was like then. And then I will tell you kind of like the inside baseball, so to speak, of how the, uh, the film was made. I mean, this was in, I want to say it was 2015. Yeah, 2014 was the Blue Sox. 2015 was the uh, Covington Stars. And we had a great turnout for the premiere at the Kenton County Public Library. And maybe some of you were at that uh, premiere. So um, the baseball in the 
70s. You have to go back even a little bit before that to the 1850s to kind of understand um, exactly how things uh, shaped up here in this region. Of course, we all know, I'm sure most of us know, for baseball fans, that the Cincinnati Red Stockings were the first professional baseball team to ever pay their players. They put out a starting nine, everybody was paid, and they just ran through the competition. They went undefeated in 1869 and 1870. And of course, they folded in 1871. Now, I get in this argument all the time whenever I'm working with the Hall of Reds Hall of Fame, and people want to say, established in 1869, that makes us the oldest team. Well, technically, we're not the oldest baseball team. The oldest baseball team is the Atlanta Braves, who they have to be playing tonight, the Cincinnati Reds. So how it, how it is to, to explain, in 1869, the Reds were the first professional team. Yes. In 1871, they disbanded. So that team closed up shop. It wasn't until 1882 that the Reds that we know and love today formed. So the 1882 Cincinnati Reds is the first team. So it should say established in 1882, but I digress. That is an argument for another day. But let's go back to before the Civil War. And you can actually pinpoint the history of baseball west of the Alleghenies, and in particular Cincinnati, the Queen City of the West. You can pinpoint a 2.5 stretch, mile stretch on the Ohio River right across from Dayton, Kentucky, called Fulton, Ohio. Now, Fulton, Ohio, named after Robert Fulton, the steamboat, the king of the steamboats, if you will, he began, Fulton began a steamboat production epicenter. It was unbelievable how many steamboats. I want to say, if my history is right, it was 900 boats were produced between 1816 and 1880. 900 steamboats were built on the shipyards in Fulton, which is today Columbia Parkway and that side of the East End, which was where Fulton is across from Dayton, Kentucky. <clears throat> so that, that little stretch in the 1840s was booming. 25% of the ships that were up and down the Mississippi and Ohio rivers were built in Cincinnati at that time in the decade of the 1840s. So as you can imagine, it was a bustling epicenter of caulkers, carpenters, um, you name it, when it was in the ship building business, it was around this area. Now, what does it have to do with baseball? I'm going to tell you. In 1859, a gentleman by the name of Henry Putter, Henry Putter was a riverboat captain. He was from Pennsylvania. He fought in the Civil War a little few years later. And he set up shop in what was then called Jamestown, Kentucky. So you had Jamestown and Brooklyn, Kentucky, which is today's Dayton, Kentucky. So imagine those two cities are what Dayton is today. But back then in the 1840s, it was Jamestown and Brooklyn. And he had his business in Brooklyn and he lived in Jamestown. But his business was he was a captain. He also employed people for carpentry, uh, caulking, and things of that elk for shipbuilding. So he was a pretty successful businessman once he got here. And he decided that he was going to start a baseball club. Now, what was baseball? You got to think in the 1850s, baseball was not what it is today. It was a combination of cricket and town ball. So it, was, it wasn't the same rules as you're used to seeing today, but he decided to form a club called the Eagles of Brooklyn, Kentucky. And this is in 1859, 10 years before the Cincinnati Red Stockings played their first professional game. So 10 years before that, Henry Putter gets his, his uh, friend, Jim Mahaffey, his friend, Mr. Brickler, his friend, Michael Kennedy, gets all these guys that live on the Ohio side, remember they're going across to work in the Cincinnati side with Fulton to build these ships. They all live over here in Dayton, Jamestown, Brooklyn. And he gets all his friends to form this baseball club. Now he challenges anyone in 1859 in a hundred mile radius. Anybody that wants to challenge us to a baseball game, come to our yards over here at 7th and Berry Street and we will challenge you to a match game. Well, there wasn't a lot of baseball teams in this area then, of course. There was a few club teams here and there. And it wasn't until 1861 that Cincinnati had a team. It was called the, the Buckeye Club of Cincinnati. Now, the Buckeye Baseball Club of Cincinnati, Matthew Yorston, fields a team mostly made up of doctors and lawyers and, and people of that profession. And they played their games in the old General Hospital over on Central Avenue and 12th Street in Cincinnati. And they played in the field that was adjacent to that. 
and they were playing again a combination of cricket town ball and baseball so in 1861 he says aha mr putter i will challenge your team the eagle baseball club of brooklyn to a match game of baseball over in your grounds let's do it what happens in 1861 the civil war starts so of course that game puts is put on hold all of these gentlemen mostly in the kentucky side fight for the kentucky 15th infantry they are going off to war they come back and of course they disband the team they don't have time to to do a baseball team when the war is going on they come back and in 1866 they say aha let's play this game that we talked about in 1861. so matthew yorston in cincinnati it's now called the live oak baseball club it dropped the buckeye name but the brooklyn baseball club still exists and on september 8 1866 these two teams meet in the first ever match baseball game to take place west of the alleghenies so again this is before the red stockings and before all of the professional baseball things happened in cincinnati this is a few years before that now the live oaks come over on, on a, a ferry they play the eagles on seventh and barry street in today's dayton kentucky and the Live Oaks win 52 to 41. Now that might sound like a pretty good high school basketball score, but again, different rules back then and runs were scored at a premium, a lot different. It's like the Reds bullpen was pitching for the Eagle team. It's just a little shot there at the Reds. I can do that. I work for them. So the, the clubs play this game. They have this guy from Brooklyn that everybody's talking about. And it was in the papers then. It was in the coffee shops, in the saloons. They always talked about this guy named Mr. Mahaffey. Now, Mr. Mahaffey swung a bat. The bat was like 12 inches. He had his own bat that he carved from a tree, and he swung with one hand. And in his first time up, he hits one over the schoolhouse for a home run because it goes over the schoolhouse and he rounds the bases of the home run. The second time he gets up, he swings with one hand. He hits it over the schoolhouse, another home run. So the Eagles are doing great. This is unbelievable. Well, the Buckeye Club, Live Oak Club now, they get wise to this and they put a, a fielder behind the schoolhouse. So when the ball is hit over the schoolhouse, the guy can catch it. So that's what happened. And the, of course, the Eagles were like, this is outrageous. How can you put a team there? So an argument ensued. Uh, they eventually mended, mended fences. They got together, said, okay, fine. We get it. We, there's no rule book technically, that, so to speak. So we'll let you have it. So 52 to 41, the Live Oaks win. And it's the very first game to ever take place in greater Cincinnati. And it happened at 7th and Berry Street in Dayton, Kentucky. Now, now today, the railroad tracks kind of go through that because this is before the railroad tracks were put in um, in 1866. It was a flat piece of land, and that's where the game took place. And one day, we're going to put a marker there. Mark my words, we're going to put a historical marker there. So baseball now is established. You've got this club. The Eagles, you got this club in Cincinnati, the Live Oaks. All of a sudden, the next few months, the Copex of Covington, the Newport Baseball Club, the Ludlow Baseball Club, Walnut Hills, all these clubs in the late 1860s start popping up. And now you've got, of course, Harry Wright and his brother George. They come over from New York. They, uh, form the, they help form the Red Stockings with other folks, of course, who are involved. And of course, the rest is history. We know that the Cincinnati Red Stockings are the first team. They establish professional sports, not just baseball. They establish the, the, the book of how to run a professional sports franchise. And it all started right here in Cincinnati in 1869. Well, like I said before, in 1871, after a, a crazy, crazy run of, of undefeated baseball, the Red Stockings lose a game. And the game, they lose this game and the press just eats them alive. How could they lose a game? Oh, I cannot believe it. The fans are talking. They lost the game. It's the end of baseball as we know it. And they were right. That was the end. They lost the game. Interest dwindled because of one loss. Now, of course, baseball is a little different back then. So it wasn't like a bullpen came in and blew it. It was one of those things where once they lost, that's what they had going for them in 1869, 1870. By the time the season started to roll around here in 71, there's no interest. Or so they thought. Because in 1871, a team in Covington, Kentucky forms. And they call themselves the Covington Stars. Now, the Covington Stars are made up of mostly players. Um, again, this is a rich man's sport. So it's doctors and lawyers. Their starting first baseman is James Ernst, who is also the captain. He played, uh, he was a captain for Princeton baseball team. So Ivy League man. 
The catcher was Pierce Barnes. Pierce Barnes was a Yale man. So again, you've got these guys that are coming in. They live in Covington. They're, they work for the railway. They're lawyers. They, they're doctors. They're of the upper elk of, of the citizens of Covington. And they form the Covington team. Now, it's just an amateur team. It's not professional at this point. Well, they start to get pretty good. Of course, the guys that play um, are experienced town ball, cricket, and baseball players. So they're getting pretty good. And once the Red Stockings are done in 1871, there has to be something to fill that void for the folks that are still interested in baseball. And who is it? It's the Covington Stars. The Covington Stars form their amateur team. They start to play teams in Maysville, uh, Frankfurt, Lexington. They go across the river and play in Cincinnati. And they played for four years as an amateur team from 1870 to 1874. And their record was 79 and eight. So they were very, very good. Um, again, you have to understand the baseball teams popped up. They came and went. It's not like today where there was anything um, written down, any kind of certain you know, schedule. It was kind of like, let's just play if we got teams to play. Well, in 1871, there was a national association that formed. And there was no Cincinnati involved. Like I said, they had folded up shop. But Harry Wright took all the players, most of the players from Cincinnati, and went to Boston. And they became the Boston Red Stockings. And the Boston Red Stockings obliterated the competition. They were the champions nearly every year. All the basically the Cincinnati Red Stockings East. So Boston, he just went to Boston and he did everything there. Cincinnati in this in this area had nothing but the stars, an amateur team. Well, Ludlow comes into the mix and they decide that they want to have an amateur team. So Ludlow forms a Ludlow baseball club. Well, now you've got Ludlow. And you've got Covington, and they're battling it out. A nice rivalry, no, no, no bloodshed, a nice rivalry for these two river cities. And they go ahead and they compete until 1875. Now, here's where everything changes. Okay, again, 1871, the National Association of Baseball Clubs forms. The first major league, Harry Wright's in Boston, takes all the Cincinnati players. What are the fans going to do? They're going to root for Ludlow. They're going to root for Covington. There's no Cincinnati team at this point. Okay. So Jim Merst has the idea. He says, let's turn professional. We have enough good players. Our record's outstanding. I think that we could get into the National Association. Well, didn't quite work out like that. Everybody said Covington who? So it wasn't like they were uh, on the tip of the tongue in the baseball um, you know, elk. So they decide that in April 26, on April 26, 1875, these local businesses get together at the Feldhaus Cigar Store on Madison Avenue. And you've got S.N. Halls. He's the club president. You've got a judge, uh, James B. Casey. He's on the board of directors. One of the family members, Thomas H. Kennedy, founding uh, father of Covington, who built the first house. His father built the first house company. He's on the board of directors. So you've got these who's who of Covington, these businessmen, these judges, these lawyers, all of these folks that have you know, a say so and what happens in Covington, Kentucky, and they form the Star Baseball Club of Covington. They are now professional. They are going to pay their players. So $25 a piece for stock, uh, 100 shares of stock. They notice the corporation was put in the newspaper and here we go. We're off and running. Well, of course, they need a place to play. So where do they play? Well, in May, the first week of May in 1875, they've got the money in their pocket, they're ready to go. They're a professional baseball club. They need grounds. They go to 17th and 18th between Madison and Scott. Now, this lot of land, it's 400 by 400 feet, and they buy it. I do not remember off the top of my head who they bought it from, but they purchased this land, and it's pretty flat. And today, it's where the Dollar General is, so it's right under the underpass, and you'll, you'll know it right there, 17th and 18th, Madison and Scott. Uh, again, another place we need to put a marker. Um, they decide to hire Warring and Blick Lumber Company, and the Warring and, Warring and Blick Lumber Company say, we can do it, we fence it all in, build your grandstand for $360. The stars say, sounds good to me. They say, who can we get to be the grounds crew guy? Well, there was a local farmer who did a great job of paving for buildings, and he was kind of known as a nice guy that would work on the cheap. His name was Thomas Mor Morrissey. And Thomas Morrissey builds the grandstand. He fences it all in, builds a little reporter box so the newspaper reporter can sit in there with, in the shelter from the elements. And they say, what would you charge us? Do it on a yearly basis. Just, you know, maintain it. $800 a year, I got gotcha. you. 
So they hire him, $800 a year. Thomas Morrissey is now the new superintendent of the park. And the entire park costs $1,200 to build. Again, this wasn't an epic sprawling stadium they were building. It was basically level the land, let's be able to put bases down, or iron is what was used then, slabs of iron. And they built a fence around this 400 by 400 foot lot. So if you go over there tonight, when you're done with this, when the presentation's over, you can sit in the parking lot. And if you're looking at the railroad tracks and you're facing the two houses that are there in the corner, and the first base side would be uh, the Dollar General, the second base would be in the middle of the Dollar General there. And then third base would be a little bit over. And if you're looking north, uh, west, that's where home plate would have been. So one day we're going to get that marked. So people can go and see where the uh, the baseball field was located. So they got the park, they've got the finances all uh, settled, everything was going great. Now they got to start getting these games in. Now, it's one thing to play amateur teams. You want to play Ludlow, that's fine. You want to play Frankfurt, that's fine too. But the big money was in the National Association teams. People wanted to see the Harry Wrights of the world. Um, they wanted to see the stars. So when the stars form and Ludlow, of course, at the same time, follow suit. They become professional. They're not as good as Covington. They don't get as much pub. I'm working on another short doc on them because they have a significant history as well. But it's kind of it's something separate that I want to tell. It's really fascinating. And that'll be coming hopefully next year. Um, Covington's got this all figured out now. They're going to play these teams. They're going to pack them in. There's Cincinnati fans. They have no team. There's fans in Ludlow that are going to come in and they're going to want to watch the stars because they don't like their their squad there's lots of uh i've heard i've read things where the ludlow fans were they were so they were trying so hard to keep the ludlow baseball fans in Ludlow. they would offer tickets for 10 cents if it was 25 cents for Covington, you can come into our park for 10 cents whatever it took to get them into the park to buy some beer and play some baseball but Covington was the the, the supreme of the area absolutely no question about it um their records spoke for themselves they were good um, an interesting fact about 1875, before I get into the season for the Stars, is that the first major league game to ever be played in the Cincinnati area, it wasn't the Cincinnati Reds. Again, they weren't a member of an A-League in 1869. It wasn't uh, the 1882 Reds. This was before that. In 1875, September the 21st, the Hartford, Connecticut Dark Blues played the Philadelphia White Stockings in a game at Covington Stars. They used their grounds because there was a flood at one of the parks, I don't remember if it was Philly or Hartford, one of their parks was inundated with water. So they were already doing an uh, East Coast trip or a West trip to the West, I should say. And they said, can we use your park? So Hartford placed Philadelphia in Covington on that spot where you know, 17th and 18th, Madison and Scott. It's the very first major league game, two national association teams playing each other in September of that year. So that's a little bit of a, a fun fact for you. So they're a professional team. Their ballpark's being built. It's May. The calendar rolls over to June. From June 4th to June 10th, to make some money, Covington goes on a tour of Kentucky. They go to Louisville. They beat Louisville. They go to Frankfurt. They beat Frankfurt. They go to Lexington. They spank Lexington. They go to Paris, and they go to Maysville. They're 6-0. and They outscored their opponents 101-20. to they just destroy all of the best amateur teams in the state. 101 runs to 20. Unbelievable. It, they're, now they're starting to build some momentum because the telegraphs are coming in from Lexington. Their telegraphs are coming in. The telegrams are coming in from Paris, Maysville. It's like they won again. They won again. They won 55 to 2. They're unbelievable. So it was decided that at the southeast corner of 6th and Madison, Rex Leas Hall was there and the popularity, they were coming in to get the telegrams. It was the crowd was overflowing on the street. They decided to erect a giant scoreboard. They just got a big piece of wood, put it on the corner there at six in Madison. And when the telegrams would come in, they would write down what was going on. Now, of course it's coming in later. So you're not getting, this isn't a live Twitter feed of the games or it's not the MLB at bat app, um, if you will. It's, as the telegrams come in, the telegrams come in, they, they get the line, it goes in, they say, okay, Covington scored two in the bottom of the second. They ride in and cheers would go up. It was like live watching a game um, at a sports bar, but it was on the, it was on the uh, corner of six in Madison. So they are just gaining popularity. Fans are starting to be like, this is great. We've got a great team. 
an independent professional team, but still we've got a professional team in Covington. June 11th, 1875, the Stars come home on a train. They come home from, I believe their last game was in Maysville, so they come back uh, via Maysville. The ladies, so lo in love with this team, the Stars, uh, so the Covington ladies, they get together, they form this, this little group, and they sew two giant, huge flags, white flags with a blue star in the middle for the Covington Stars. They place one of these flags high atop Drexley's Hall at the corner of 6th and Madison, and it flies in the wind magnificently. And they put another one in center field of Star Baseball Grounds at 17th, 18th, Madison, and Scott. So the first game, the first home game, they're, they're coming in, they're 6 0, they're feeling great about themselves. They've had this big reception. The ladies love them. Covington is in love with the, the Stars. They, June 14th, 1875. They get their first real test against a national association team. And that team is the St. Louis Red Stockings. Now, the St. Louis Red Stockings aren't the greatest team in the, in the national association. As a matter of fact, they were usually near the bottom of the standings. Nonetheless, they were a professional team. So a national association team at that. So they go to Star Baseball Grounds on June 14, 1875, and they crush the Stars 19 to nothing. I, I have a, a theory of why, and it's probably because they were drunk the night before from the celebration of, or the few days before from getting the celebration um, of being undefeated. They, they come into town, they've got these, they're presented with flags, they got these crisp new uniforms, everything is going great. And then St. Louis comes in and says, we're a professional team, let's just show how it's done. So they obliterate 19 to nothing to final score, but that did not stop the stars, it did not. Because a week later, so enthralled with Covington was their star pitcher, Mr. Joe Blom of the St. Louis Red Stockings, that he said, you know what, I'll pitch for you guys if you pay me a little bit more money. And of course, this was a time when contracts were meaningless. You could jump from team to team to team to team without any repercussions. And Joe Blom was one of the best pitchers, a bad team, but one of the best pitchers in the National Association. He says, not only will I come play for you, Covington, my teammates, Denny Mack, Packy Dillon, Silver Flint, and Trick McSorley. You got to love a guy named Trick. That's a fantastic nickname. These four guys join him on the Covington Stars. So now we've got some association players on our team. So <laughs> things are starting to shape up here for the Covington Stars. One of the cool things about uh, Blong was, I mean, I'll get into him a little in a little bit later, but he, him bringing over those, those teammates, I believe it was uh, Packy, Trick, McSorley, and uh, Joe Blong. They were all, uh, they all went to Notre Dame and played baseball at Notre Dame, which was like town ball in the 1860s. So they were Notre Dame graduates. So our guys, um, Joe Blong has a record that still stands to this day. He pitched 320 innings without allowing a home run. 320 straight innings without giving up a home run in his professional career. So... In 1877, he's banned from baseball for gambling because, again, good pitcher, not the greatest human being in the world. He's banned a few years later from playing baseball. But in 1875, he's still doing great things. It's unbelievable. He brings over his teammates. The Stars keep winning. They're doing great things. June 23rd rolls around. The Washington Nationals come into town, and it's Covington against the Washington Nationals, and the starting pitcher is Joe Blong, and Joe Blong beats them 12 to 9. So 12 to 9, Covington Stars beat the Washington Nationals. It's the first time they beat a professional team. The city goes crazy. 6,000 fans crammed into the ballpark, waving their pennants, going absolutely nuts. They win that game. Now they've got the momentum. More Cincinnati fans are coming in. The more money's rolling in. July 10th, finally, Covington plays Ludlow. So professional Covington plays professional Ludlow. Covington was kind of like blowing them off like the little brother. Yeah, we'll get to you guys later. We've got the Washington Nationals over here to beat. Now, just for the record, it's not the same Washington Nationals of the day. This is a previous club, but still Washington, D.C., professional team. Pretty cool that Covington was able to play them and beat them. So July 10th, 1875, Covington plays Ludlow. 6,000 fans come into Star Baseball Grounds, and Covington wins 2-0. to zero. A very, very, very low score against that time. Ludlow tried their hardest. They tried everything in the book. Hidden ball tricks, you name it. Spitballs, you name it. They tried everything to beat the Stars, but two to nothing. Covington wins, and of course, 
this means kind of like college football used to be where you had that mythical champion. The same thing applies here. Covington was now the mythical state champion. They beat the best teams in Louisville, Frankfurt, Paris, Maysville. They beat Ludlow. There's nobody else to beat. So they were known as the champions of Kentucky. And they put that on a banner and they rung that up at 6th and Madison, right underneath the flag that was the big star that the ladies had sewn for them. So they are sky high right now. One of the great things is, is that the popularity of not just Coventonians and Northern Kentuckians, but you also have to think about Cincinnatians who are spending Cincinnati dollars in Covington. They want a team, their team left, and they had nothing to, to root for. The, the miscalculation of the Red Stockings saying baseball's right up because they yelled at us because we lost the game. Well, we're out of here. There's still a thirst for baseball. There's still a passion for this new game called baseball. And these guys were coming in, into Cincinnati. So two days after that, Ludlow Covington were the champions of Kentucky. Nobody can beat us pounding our chests. That happens two days later. Former Red Stockings club member, John P. Joyce. He wasn't a player. He was on the board of directors and he was kind of like a front office guy for the Red Stockings in 1869 to 1871. He sees what's going on in Ludlow and Covington. He understands that this, this is a big deal, okay? Why are Cincinnati baseball fans spending all their money over here and supporting this, you know, bottom feeder, little brother, Covingtonian club? Where's Cincinnati? The best team ever was just here a couple of years ago. I'm John P. Joyce, and I'm going to reform the Covington Red Stockings. And so that's what he does. The new Reds are going to form in the uh, late summer of uh, 1875. They purchased 10 acres of land off of Spring Grove Avenue, and it's next to Mill Creek, uh, right above the stockyards. So right north of the stockyards, right along Mill Creek. Terrible place for a ballpark, by the way, because it always flooded. But nonetheless, they built this great ballpark. It's fantastic. Now they've got this new team. They're a professional team. They don't have a league yet because they're just kind of testing the waters. They're an independent professional team, just like Covington is. So... August 4th, 1875, the Covington Stars record is 25 and four. 25 wins, four losses on August the 4th, 1875. They're mopping up competition. And they're all four losses were against uh, the Chicago White Stockings, uh, the Boston Red Stockings. The Chicago White Stockings were actually the Cubs. They became the Chicago Cubs. Uh, fun fact for you there. Uh, but all of the professional teams were beating. So only four losses were really close games with those guys. Um, but here's where it gets tricky. The stars now realize they have a problem because they see that the stars are starting, or the, sorry, the Reds have this new stadium, this new uh, park. They have a resurgence. They call themselves the Cincinnati Red Stockings. So now all of the fans that were coming over here, they scoot across the river and they're like, the, the Red Stockings are back, baby. We're going to watch the Red Stockings. This is what happens. Here's the problem. The stars are, have a dilemma on their hands. They love the fact that red, the Reds are back because it means that more teams are going to come to the area. So Boston's going to make more than one trip. They're going to come four or five times. St. Louis is going to come four or five times to the area to play Cincinnati. Philadelphia, Chicago, Hartford, all of these professional teams are going to come to the area to play the Reds. This is great. Now, granted, we're going to lose some fans because Cincinnati's got a bigger population. They're going to root, root, root for the Reds. Of course, that makes sense. But the wheels are spinning. All these teams are going to come in. When they come into town, we'll schedule their games first. So they play us first, then they go over there. So if they come into town on a Friday, hey, Friday afternoon, you guys want to play a game? 50 cents to get in, 25 cents, whatever you want to do. Come on in, and then you can go over there and play those guys. Yeah, the Reds, we've heard of them. They're over there. So that was their plan, and it, and it, it, it worked for a little while. The Reds weren't too happy about this. So the Reds are like, no, wait a second here. We reformed. We're trying to rekindle that championship spirit that we invented. We're crying out loud. It's our game. We invented this. Who do you think you guys are? Well, it's decided. And this is one of those things that kind of builds in fandom and builds in the press that the, well, if you want to see who's the best team and who deserves to have the best team, the Reds and Stars have to play a game. That just makes sense, right? You two got to play a game. And then, you know, the winner will be at the top of the heap. So, of course, that makes that logical. Well, the Reds were a little timid of the Stars. They weren't sure about this. 
And there was some back and forth going on. And you can read these if you go into the archives of the Kent County Library, the Covington, the, the ticket, uh, the Covington, the journal, um, all the Covington newspapers have these little blurbs. You gotta search for it, but you'll see it in there uh, where they have transcriptions of the telegrams that were sent back and forth. But the secretaries the, the, were the ones in charge of sending these off and they were just giving information from what their directors were saying. So for instance, Covington would say, well, you tell the Reds that we'll play on one condition, tickets are 25 cents and we'll play in our stadium first and then we'll go over there and play in your stadium, you know, next month or whatever it would be. And then they'd send telegram and then the guy would read it and say, what, what's this about? No, we're playing for 50 cents because that's the standard National League uh, 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 fee. It's 50 cents to get into our park at the grandstand and we're playing at our stadium first, then we'll come over to Covington and play. They went back and forth the entire month of August. What's it gonna be? You guys want 50 cents, 25 cents, who's playing in the park? Well, Covington decided it was not worth the fight anymore. They said, you know what? Fine, 50 cents it is. We'll play at our park first, then we'll go over to Cincinnati. Since we gave you the 50 cent fee, at least do that, do us justice and let us play the first game here. And the Reds say, okay, so on, August the 31st, 1875, the Cincinnati Reds and their fans come over to Star Baseball Grounds. The, the omnibuses, the, the, the horses and buggies are just coming up Madison. It's packed. There's rumors, I've heard different reports that there was 10,000 fans in attendance, which would be really impressive to get 10,000 people. You know how newspaper articles can be. They might have uh, fudged a little bit with the uh, attendance figures, but you're talking 10,000 people crammed into that lot, 17th, 18th Madison and Scott to see this game because it's the Cincinnati Red Stockings versus the Covington Stars. It's, it's Rocky versus Drago. It's the battle of the century. So they come in to the park and it's one of the greatest games in the history of baseball in this area. In the third inning, the Reds, before I start, let me remind you, there was no home team bat second in this era of baseball. You flipped a coin. And whoever won the coin toss at the beginning of the game was they determined would they bat first or they would bat second. Well, in this instance, the stars are going to bat first, even though they're on the home field. They're going to bat first. So in the third inning, the Reds jump out one to nothing. In the fourth inning, the stars tie the game at one. So it's one to one. The Reds break their tie in the bottom of the fourth. Now it's two to one. And then the sixth inning, the stars tied up at two. In the seventh inning, the Stars jump out to a four to two lead. They're, they're going to win. They can just feel it. The fans, they're excited. They're going to win. But then the Reds score one more in the bottom of the seventh. So now it's four to three. So it's four to three. We're going to the eighth inning. The, the Stars score one more. It's five to three. We're going into the eighth. And in the bottom of the eighth, the Reds tied at five. Two, two more runs. It's five to five. Minutes. Okay, no problem. Ninth inning. We're going to have our best players coming up. Here we go. They don't score. The Reds don't score. Stars don't score, Reds don't score. We go to the 12th inning, which was unheard of in those times. Extra innings were hardly ever played. 12th inning, here's the problem. There's no lights at Star Baseball Grounds in 1875. So the game is called of darkness. It's a five to five tie. Bragging rights will be, have to be held to another day. Of course, Cotton Tony and say, we would have beat you, but this happened. And the Stars like, oh, yeah, we would have beat you, but this happened. This natural rivalry has begun because of a 5-5, to 12-inning tie. So, living up there into the bargain, the Stars on September 11, 1875, they go over to Cincinnati. It's the second game ever played in the Avenue grounds over at the Mill Creek Stockyards where they built this uh, ballpark. And the Stars beat them 6-2. to two. So, that sends Covington into a frenzy. Thousands of people in the corner of 6th and Madison are getting the, the feed from the game. They're, they're getting the telegram. And they're, actually, there were people that would shout the score, besides the telegram, would shout the score corner to corner to corner all the way to the river. And a guy had a megaphone, would scream it over so you, the guy at the riverbank could hear it, who would then relay the information to 6th and Madison, where they would put it up on the board. The Reds beat the Stars beat the Reds. The hats were thrown up in the air. It was pandemonium. So the Stars are the best team now. There was no question. They beat Ludlow. They beat every Kentucky team. And now they beat the re-energized, re resurgent Cincinnati Red Stockings. There's no question now that the best team in this area is the Covington Stars Baseball Club. Well, the season goes on. The Reds play their games. 
they do okay. They finish around 500. They may, remember, they only started in July, so they got a late start. Um, the Stars finished 38, 14, and 1, that one tie being with the Reds. So 38 wins, 14 losses, and one tie. So now the season's over. They turn the baseball park at, at uh, 17th Madison into a skating rink. They put the balls and bats away for the winter, and they're licking their lips. They cannot wait until 1876 when they are going to get better players, and they're going to become an even better team. And better yet, there's a rumor going around that there's this new league, and this new league is going to form called the National League. The National Association disbands. There are disorganized chaos. There's no professional league. The National League says, we gotcha. They step in. The National League that we know today that the Reds play in, they formed the National League in 1876. Well, as far as the players go on, on, the, on the stars, Blong gets kicked off for gambling. They replace him with a guy from the White Stockings, the Cubs, named Michael Golden, who's not as good. So they start, they start the season um, in 1876, ready to go as a professional independent club, waiting to hear back from the league, see if we can join. They don't get that telegram. They don't get that email. Nothing's coming in. Nothing's going on. They're waiting and waiting. Well, it's, it's the season's getting ready to start. What are we going to do? Well, April comes and the Reds say, hey, you guys want to schedule an exhibition game, you know, just to kind of to, to kind of get it going. And the Reds beat the Stars in Star Park. And that left a bad taste in the mouth of the Stars. It left a bad taste in the mouth of the Covington Club, who figured that they were, you know, not really ready for the season yet. So the Reds now are in a situation where they're getting uh, information from the league saying, we would like you to join. Now, this is where, this is the death sentence. This is where it all ends for our shining stars, the pride of Covington in the 1870s. It all happens when Mr. Joyce and his board of directors, they go to this meeting, the National League meeting says, of course, we'll join your league. But here's something I want you to think about rules committee. The rules committee meets and Mr. Joyce and his entourage go in and say, we think that it would be a wise decision if we could somehow make this rule where if we are a team and we're the league team, no other team around us can be a part of the league. They can't play teams that come into town. They, we can't play them. They, they are just amateurs. We got to have a monopoly. Our team rules the city. So they make up this rule. It's called the Five Mile Clause, Article 5, Section 2, and it reads this. Every club in the National League shall have exclusive control of the city in which it is located and the territory surrounding such city to the extent of five miles in every direction, and no visiting league team is allowed to play any other club in such territory other than the league club therein located, which means that if St. Louis came into town like they did in 1875, they're not allowed to play that Covington Stars team. They can only play the Reds because we are official, we're professional, we're a league. You guys are also Rams. They didn't want the competition. So the Reds squashed the Stars and Iron Fist came down. The Stars couldn't play and make any money. I mean, no offense to Walnut Hills, Cummingsville, Price Hill, uh, Newport, Ludlow, Maysville, the rest of the teams in the state. They're all fine and dandy, but nobody's going to come. We know you could beat those guys. We want to see Boston and Harry Wright come in. We want to see the Chicago White Stockings. We want to see the Philadelphia White Stockings. We want to see these pro teams. And now we can't. I guess we'll have to go over to Cincinnati because the Reds got the team. So that one, Article 5, Section 2, completely kills the professional dreams of the Covington Stars. It's over. There's nothing they can do about it at this point. Uh, they can't fight it, although a little bit later when the Covington Blue Sox, this rule still applied um, it, even, it, even today. So it, 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 the, the Blue Sox tried to argue this in court by saying that it should be separate since we're a separate state. Since we're in Kentucky and they're in Cincinnati, the dividing line of the river, it shouldn't count. But baseball is like, nah, five miles. Sorry, that's the rule. We're sticking with it. Of course they were, because they were going to make tons of money in Cincinnati. They weren't going to make money in Covington. And why would they let Covington ruin everything by getting money from Cincinnati fans coming over? So it becomes official on July 26th, 
1876, the Covington Stars are no more. They returned to amateur status, and they even played the Reds in the early 1900s. I mean, they were an amateur team for a long time, into the early 1900s, up until like 1908, 1909. They were still the Covington Stars, not as nearly as good. They were just an amateur team that got together, had a few beers, and played. The Reds did, however, play them over at Willow Run Baseball Field in the early 1900s in the ballparks that were located in that area. So there was exhibition games and barnstorming tours that did come over to Covington and play the Stars. Uh, but it was the, the it was a, not the same, lost its luster. Um, they're now an amateur team, so it doesn't matter. But there were some good players. Like I said, the Covington Stars had Jim Ernst. They also had uh, George Streep, who uh, had several records. He was a second baseman. He became the first ever player to hit a home run in Pittsburgh Pirates history. So George Streep hits the first home run in Pittsburgh Pirate history. He was the first player ever to hit five, get five hits in one game. And he was the, this, this was tied a little bit later, but he actually hit four triples in one game. So he had a few records there. He played for Covington. He actually married a woman from Covington and lived here for a while before he went back up to Cleveland. I believe he worked as a, as a police officer, a security guard in, for 50, 60 years in Cleveland. So, but he got his start in Covington. Um, played for St. Louis, came over and played with, with Covington and has a uh, assortment of records, including the very first home run in the history of the Pittsburgh Pirates. So that's kind of neat little uh, thing. Um, now, the Stars still play at Star Baseball Grounds until 1887 when they decide that, you know, what's the point of keeping this? We can develop it. In 1887, they tear down the ballpark. So the Covington Stars are no more. Their story is unique. Uh, it's it's a, a, just an unbelievable twist of fate that that and circumstances, I guess you could say, that they just weren't quite big enough. Covington was not quite big enough to maintain this. And it wasn't because there wasn't fans. It was because of the big brother in Cincinnati coming over to, like I said, an iron fist and to you know end in that. So quickly, I will just tell you how I made the film and why it became interesting to me, and then we'll get to trivia questions. Just take one minute uh, and, and the questions if anybody has any. Um, now, <clears throat> when I started this, I had first started the Covington Blue Sox doc, and I discovered that by researching um, my, some family history in the uh, late 90s, 1998, 1999. Uh, so I had built this binder <laughs> of all of the Covington Blue Sox record, I established what they, who they were, and I made a film, and I'm honored that it won an award. It was just a fantastic story. But while doing that, I realized that there were some articles that talked about the Covington Stars. I had no idea who they were. So, of course, I had to go back a little bit, and then I realized that their story is just as important, if not more important, than the Covington Blue Sox because of their place in Cincinnati baseball history and what they had done. Um, if it wasn't for Covington, the Covington Stars being so good, would there be a Cincinnati Reds? Because again, remember, they reformed because like, well, we can't let these guys get all the glory and the money. Baseball's still a big thing. Well, I had no idea. Let's form the Red Stockings. So, and then of course, the rest is history. The Red Stockings get kicked out um, of the National League for selling beer on Sunday and playing on Sundays. <laughs> a no-no back then. And they reform in 1882. And the rest is history. They become champions in 1919. They grow the World Series in 61. And you know the rest of the story. The Big Red Machine. Until today, this day, we still have one of the greatest baseball traditions in the world right here in Cincinnati. But Covington is one of the big reasons why. I, I will stand by that. Um, I've had people argue that. But I really firmly believe that would they have happened? Possibly. But that thread and that tradition, that rallying around the Reds team, because of the success of Covington and what they brought to the table, I think it's an interesting story. I was happy to do this film. It was fantastic. It was a great discovery. And working for the Cincinnati Reds Hall of Fame and being a historian and being a Northern Kentuckian, it, it touched, it was a special place in my heart to, to know that my hometown had a, a big part in baseball in the greater Cincinnati area. So there's my spiel. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you, Cam. So um, somebody already answered the trivia question, Aha. which was who was the first player for the Covington Stars that later became the first player to hit a home run for the Pittsburgh Pirates? And that was George Strife. And yes. uh, Rod Sass was the first uh, person to answer that on our uh, chat. So congratulations, Rod. We'll make sure we get your information before you log off. 
Uh, so we have a few questions that have been popping up while you've been uh, talking. So we'll go okay. over to them. Um, first of all, you mentioned uh, Town Ball and Sage Bar wanted to know what uh, exactly kind of is Town Ball, if you could just briefly describe what that is. If you've seen cricket, it's basically like Town Ball. It's really hard to describe. What I would suggest to you is to you go to YouTube, find Town Ball and cricket and, and watch that. There'll be examples of old time baseball players playing that like, a, a, you know, kind of a retro type of thing. Um, it, it was basically a formation of what became baseball. So if the pitching was different, the ball bounced, different rules. It, it's, it's, it's just the early, early stages of trying to build a nine players on a side, nine inning game. So it would be much easier for you to YouTube that and look it up what town ball is in difference. But again, to, just to give you a, a basic introduction, it's town ball, cricket and town ball are basically the same thing. And they're very popular in 1840s, 1850s. And there was an argument of what started when, how, where, and why. But those clubs that were town ball clubs eventually became baseball clubs, most of them. So if you were a cricket club, you became a baseball club. If you were a town ball club in the 1850s, you became a baseball team in the 1860s. It just was the natural progression of the sport. Um, he also asked, Sage, Sage also asked, uh, what sorts of food would be found at, at an 1880s ball game? You would not see food in most parks. Now, there are some parks in some cities that did do that. But, if, for example, if you went to uh, Covington, you were drinking beer at the game. You were drinking beer and you were drinking lots of it because of all the breweries that were here. That was what they sold. The concession stand was very, very simple. Beer. Now, a little bit later in the 19th century, it would, it would, uh, you would go over to Willow Run Park and when the Stars were playing the Reds in exhibition games as they became an amateur team. Um, hot dogs, popcorn, cracker jacks, those things kind of evolved. But when you went to a game in the 1870s, you were drinking first. Well, also being, you know, Cincinnati, of course, exactly. you had hot dogs. And oh, yes. All over the place. Absolutely. Um, and then he also asked, does Covington still have a team today, uh, any sort of amateur or professional team, which I don't think we do. No, no, no amateur professional team. Uh, the Florence Freedom is the closest. Now, again, we couldn't have a team here because of the five mile clause. So, <laughs> Yeah. You can't have it. The only way it can happen is if the owners of the Reds, if somebody came over and says, we want to put a professional team over here by the suspension bridge and we're going to build a field. And this is where the IRS site's now going to be a baseball field. He has to ask permission of Bob Castellini. And I don't think Mr. Castellini would say yes to that. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. I think he'd lose out uh, yeah. on that deal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Somebody asked, uh, Rod Sass asked uh, if you could talk to us a little bit, a little of uh, your memorabilia in the background. Oh, well, let's see. Have uh, I have, I know it kind of can be hard to see. These are just old gloves that my mother gave me. Bless her for giving me. These are awesome. They, they were um, just thrift store finds. These old 1920s, 1930s baseball gloves. This is the hat that I wore during my, uh, it's an old style, style hat from when I wore it to my, um, my uh, old Latonia racetrack premiere. I've got a 1940 Cincinnati Reds program. And these are all old Reds films that were ruined. So all these reels actually have baseball films on them, but um, we digitized them and there was some sprocket damage. So I just decided to make them wall art. Um, of course, Star Wars up there, my projector and my bookshelf. And this bad boy here is a 1947 Crosley radio, which I gutted, put an Alexa in it so I can say, Alexa, play the Cincinnati Reds baseball game. And it comes through the speaker down here at the bottom. So this was a nice find I got last Christmas, which is why I wanted I wanted to play Christmas music through an old Crosley. And of course, again, let's do baseball through an old Crosley radio. So I kind of did that. But I, I recommend if you can find one of these cheap and they don't work, just stick an Alexa in there, turn it on to get some, you can put some Christmas lights in here like I did and get the glow, the warmth of an old radio. And it's just magical, especially at Christmas time. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. <laughs> Um, let's see. Uh, Jason French just asked, do, do you know anything about the Goldenrod team that was in the 20s? I guess the 1920s? Yes, I've heard of them. A semi-pro team, the Goldenrod team. I, I don't have much information on them. I do have a few blurbs in a notebook and some clippings, but I have heard of that. I believe, and I could be wrong, that they were a semi-pro team. So they were not all professional, not all amateur. They were kind of a mix. Okay. Um, and then I had the question, um, does the Reds Hall of Fame talk about the Covington stars at all or do they gloss they, over? they do not another oh. little sticky point with me that I'm telling you one day we are going to get that in there we talked about showing my film there um, back in 2015 2016 but uh there was just so much going on with the all-star game in 2015 and then you know just 
always projects are always four or five years in advance. So you're mm -hmm. always working on the thing that's going to be shown, you know, at a later date, three, four or five years in advance. We've always got things rolling, but I'm not ruling it out. We've talked about it. Just like we talked about trying to get a marker down there at the uh, 17th and 18th Madison Scott. And uh, just to let people know that Hall of Famers came to that spot. There was baseball professionally played here. So something else we're trying to think of. There's just so much rich history, especially with baseball, that I think people need besides watching me talk or listening to me talk and watching a video, if you can tangibly go to that place, um, I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, Michael Wallace wants to know if you can buy any Covington Stars merchandise anywhere. Uh, not yet, but follow me on Twitter at Cam Miller Films. Go to my Facebook, Cam Miller Films, my YouTube. We may be having some Covington Stars things and Covington Blue Stocks things very soon. So nothing concrete yet. <laughs> very cool. Well, thank you for... Um, tonight's presentation very absolutely thank learned you a lot. very much um especially about you know the first baseball game not being the reds in, right. in, in dayton i mean i live in dayton so it's just a few blocks from me so it's incredible i think about it all the time yeah i'm sure that's why the reds don't want you to uh put that in the i you know uh, no, we've got I, I do work for them they're my number one client but we've got a little bit of a rivalry going <laughs> only kentucky versus cincy it still exists man <laughs> Well, before we go, I just want to uh, thank everybody for attending tonight. Um, don't forget um, that BCM music uh, continues tomorrow night with uh, Sondel Caribe. Also mark your calendars for Fresh Art on September 18th, 2021. Uh, tickets are on sale now. Uh, that is all the time we have uh, for this evening. Thank you to all the sponsors and supporters of BCM. Thanks to the staff, trustees, and members of the Barringer Crawford Museum. For more Northern Kentucky history throughout the week, check out the Facebook page and our YouTube channel, where you can find the latest installment of the Curator's Chat, where BCM Curator of Collections, Jason French, takes on fascinating places and artifacts from BCM collection across the region. Please like and subscribe. There will not be another History Hour next week. Our next presentation will be on August 25th with Dr. Tenacotti discussing the history of Park Hills. Thank you again, Cam. Everybody have a great night. Thank we'll you. See you all soon.